Good morning, and welcome to Sunset Road Baptist Church this morning. Uh, please stand and sing with us as we prepare our hearts for worship. That's not the first one. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my. this morning. We thank you that you are the air we breathe. Help us to remember that we're lost without you. Help us to be desperate for you. Help us to breathe you in and breathe out your love. Dear God, we pray you will be with us this morning. We pray that you will be glorified in all we say and do. We thank you that we're able to worship together in, I'm going to say, normal. And we thank you for that. 
We pray that you will keep us safe and healthy. We thank you for those that are here and online. Uh, and we pray you will bless us all. Help us to live lives that glorify you and love others and point others to you. And, uh, we pray for this afternoon. We pray that we will uh, have a great time together in fellowship and uh, uh, that we will attract uh, the community around to your love and to what we have here and uh, for them to join us. We just thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. Whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary, we are glad that you're with us. We've got a, a great day ahead of us. Matthew's already hinted at just some of the things that are going to be happening today. If you are a first time guest with us, you may notice on your bulletin there's this little tab that, that juts out over the edge. If you will be so kind as to tear that off and then Fill it out and place it in the offering plate when it's passed later on. Then we'll have a record of your worship with us, and we thank you so much. If you would uh, like to have more information about the church, if you're interested in becoming a member of the church, if you'd like a visit from me uh, or more information, just check the appropriate boxes on the, that little form. And thank you very much. Well, we are having our reopening celebration today. Uh, we are here and can see, I'm seeing faces I haven't seen in a long time. Not just, yeah, there. Not just that we can see one another's faces without a mask, but also because I've already seen a number of folks that have been, been a, unable to be with us during the pandemic, and they're back this morning. We welcome you uh, into God's house today as well. It's just so good to be together. As Matthew's already hinted, following the worship this morning, we're going to be proceeding out to the ball field, which is the area behind Helderman Hall, and we're going to have a cook, hot dog cookout with all the goodies and a kickball game for those who are interested in playing. For those of you, like myself, who have aged out of such activities, you can join me under the tree for a time of fun, fellowship, and laughter. But we're gonna have a great time this afternoon, and I noticed uh, in looking at the weather this morning, the weather was gonna cooperate. It's gonna be in the upper 70s, low 80s, perfect time to be outside together. I also wanna encourage you to help our youth by donating to the Youth Fund. This will help our kids and their parents uh, go to the beach retreat on June the 26th through July the 1st. Now, if you have something to do around your house, you've got a chore you would like to be ha had done, the youth will be glad to do it. And Betty Ruth can testify to the fact they do a great job. <laughs> all right, all you got to do is fix cookies and then make a donation to the youth fund uh, for this trip. We would appreciate it very much. You may have noticed in your bulletin that Vacation Bible School date has been set. It's Saturday, July the 17th. We're going to have a, a great day of fun, fellowship, and Bible adventure together. I want, to in, I want you to be, encourage you, children, to invite your, your cousins, your friends, your neighbors, and also please note adults that we, that we still need some helpers. Yes, so see Jason if you can help with that. Uh, also, I want to... I see Chris sitting here. Uh, Chris is going to be on Beat Bobby Flay this week on Food Network on Thursday evening. What time does it come on? 8.30. 8.30. So we've already seen him one win Chopped before, and now he's going to go to the go and try to beat Bobby Flay. And uh, having watched Bobby play a time or two, beat, beat him to, to pieces, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. Okay. Also, you may note this morning that... I've been, I've been your pastor for 31 years, and this is the first time I've ever entered the pulpit on Sunday morning without two things, a coat and a tie. And you notice this morning that I'm dressed casually. Now, part of that is because we're, we're, we ask everyone to dress casually so we can go out and have a good time after the service is over. But also, I want to get you accustomed to what your new pastor may do when they come. These days, it's hard to find a traditionalist who will wear a coat and tie on Sunday mornings. Now, they may find them, but it's unlikely because more and more pastors, 
particularly younger pastors, and some pastors my age, will wear more casual attire Sunday by Sunday. So just to get you accustomed to that, okay? How about we make an agreement together, okay? Let's make this casual summer, all right? And I'll come more casually addressed, and you can get, you can get accustomed to this, so whenever the pastor search committee comes with the person they feel like God is calling to be the next pastor of this church, you'll be accustomed to what they're wearing. And it won't be such a shock not to see that coat and tie. In other words, they may be dressed more like Jason and Matthew on a typical Sunday morning. So does anybody have any objection to me dressing casually this summer? Hallelujah! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It'll save on my uh, laundry bill for one thing. So I do appreciate that, and Pam will as well. It's not as hot either, that's right. All right, it's good to be in God's house today. I hope that you have come prepared to worship in spirit and truth. And right now I'm going to ask uh, Matt, uh, let's see, we are at the welcome our guests. We've done that call to worship. Is Jason, Jason, come on up and have the call to worship and our prayer of invocation. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. Um, Yes, Vacation Bible School, uh, we're all excited. We, we hit the ground running last week with a meeting and, and got some things lined up. Um, and like Steve said, um, I, there, there's two positions. We talked, I talked about it last week. One um, is I need prayer warriors. I need, I need all of those. That, you know, We understand physically you can't make it or you just don't want to be here because you don't like kids. That's fine. Um, but I ask... Um, that you pray for our vacation Bible school. We can certainly do that. And so I need prayer warriors. Um, if you guys will just pray for this year, we're, we're praying that big things will happen. We're praying for a great turnout, big numbers. Um, and so uh, in order to help us with those numbers, I also need uh, publicity warriors. And so please, like Steve said, tell everybody that you know uh, that has young kids our ages. Uh, we're doing three-year-olds all the way through sixth grade. Uh, that's our age brackets, the way we have set up. So if you know anybody that's got somebody in that age group, then uh, please let them know uh, of our Vacation Bible School. I would appreciate it. Now, uh, something I heard this week uh, kind of resonated with me, uh, and that is the old proverb that says, iron sharpens iron. We've heard it a, a lot of times, but have we ever really thought about it? And have, we ever, have we ever really thought about what that means? Have we ever applied that to our relationships? Uh, you see, a lot of times uh, when we have something, the best example I can give is we all know um, what it, what it is to cut wood. You know, you take an axe, you chop wood, and what happens to that axe over time? It becomes dull, right? Uh, what happens to the wood? Well, it gets busted up. And so if we look at iron sharpening iron and apply that to our relationships, a lot of times in relationships, we have a lot of dead wood hanging out with us. And we're, we're the iron, and we're hanging out with dead wood. And that dead wood doesn't do anything but dull who we are and bring us down to their level. And in some relationships, we're the dead wood, Right? We have people in our lives that are constantly pouring into us, and we're not doing anything but bringing them down. So I just want to share that with you, to, to reflect back on your own, uh, just to think about what you can do in your relationships um, apart from here, uh, to, to be, uh, be better, do better, and try to um, uh, just resonate on that. Our scripture today is Psalm 145, 1 through 5. It says this, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for this day and this time that we can come together uh, and join uh, as one body to worship you and to lift up your name and praise you. And Father God, you alone are worthy of that praise. Lord, we're so thankful for your son Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross to be our salvation. And Lord, I ask that our, our praise and worship would be honoring unto you today. Lord, strengthen us to, to leave this place so that we may be um, a light to this community and salt to the earth. Jesus Christ, we love you. We claim these things in your name. Amen.
and then join me in singing Unbroken Praise.
I gotta tell you why Kelly's laughing. She once told me uh, when she was singing over there that she didn't like when I sang when yeah, she said, you got to hush if I'm singing because I throw her off. That's because anybody would be thrown off by my singing. So you, I told her right then, I said, some people will go to anything. Notice how she moved over here to keep from listening to me sing. <laughs> so, so, hey, you know what? God liked it. And I'm not, I'm not going I'm I'm to let Kelly be my judge this morning, but I love her so much. <laughs> well, I'm thankful to be here today. I'm thankful that after one of the worst periods of history, not just my lifetime, but of history, we're able to be here this morning and feel comfortable being in our presence. We've never been uncomfortable being in God's presence, but now we're comfortable being in one another's presence. And I want you to know something. I love you, and I thank God that we're able to be together this morning. Notice what it says here, a time of congregational praise. It says, why I'm thankful this morning. Why are you thankful this morning? Anybody? I think John's got it all set up so you'll be heard uh, online and everything. So what's your, what's your word of praise and thanks this morning? Thank you for uh, the Sunday school teacher they had in adult three. That's Scott Lawing this morning. We're, we give thanks for that. I guess it is Scott, right? It was Scott, right? Okay, okay, got it. All right, somebody else, what are you thankful for this morning? I know, I'm so thankful to see the choir back. I tell you what, I got a grin on my face when I saw them walking in the choir loft today. Someone else. That's right, thankful Ralph's back today. He's been having some health problems. Thankful that Eva's back today. She's been having some health problems. Uh, and so we're glad that both of them are able to be here this morning. Now, Kelly. Overwhelming response for donations, volunteers, for the reopening. That's right. Thank you. We're looking forward to that event, too. And thank you for all your support in this matter. Anybody else who's thankful for something specific this morning? I'm sitting next to them. You're sitting next to your grandchildren. That, nice, Larry. Holden. I'm so, th I thank you for sharing that. God, oh, I love you, Holden, and I thank God for you sharing this. Someone else, what are you thankful for? Tyler. I'm thankful for this church. We're, so are we, th Tyler, thank you, and we're thankful for you too, and we're going to have your baptism coming up very soon, so we're looking forward to that as well. Anybody else, something you're thankful for this morning? Oh, there you go, Scott. Thankful that we're getting back to normal. All right. Well, let's, uh, yes, Nina. I'm thankful to be here. Um, you know, I've been having problems with my back and stuff, so I missed the last two weeks, and I hated that. But today's a really good day, and I have many more to go, I hope. <laughs> there you go, Nina. We're glad you're back today. We missed you the last two weeks. and. Yeah. We're going to pray that back does better for you. Thank you. Well, Audrey, will you play a little bit as we go to the Lord in prayer, and then I'll close our season of prayer. Heavenly Daddy, God, we thank you for allowing us to be in this place today. Father, over the course of a very difficult 15 to 16 months, you have been with us. And even though we could never say that life is completely back to normal because so many families have suffered such terrible loss, we give you praise that we are able to be here this morning. And we lift up those who have been so devastated by this pandemic. Father, we pray that each and every day the pandemic will be, begin to fade into the background. We know that there are still people who are sick. We know that there are still people who are hospitalized. And yes, there are still people who are dying. But Father, we thank you for the progress that we have seen. And we give you praise for the progress that is to come. 
Father, we thank you for our church. We thank you that we can be back in this place today. Father, it's so good to be able to see the smiles, to see the joy in people's faces, and to know that we are here together to glorify and praise your name. Father, may all of your praise be unbroken, because, Father, may it be coming from our lips. Father, we pray for those who are on our prayer list today. Father, we lift them up to you and ask that you care for them. We pray in a special way this morning for Dot Case. Father, you know Dot's situation. It seems that she is very close to the end as hospice has been called in. And Father, we just ask you to make her homegoing gentle, kind, and blessed. Because, Father, we know that the moment she breathes her last breath on this earth, she will be received into your presence in heaven. And Father, we pray for Martha Griffin. We pray, Father, that her hip replacement surgery goes well this, this week. We know, Father, that she has suffered so terribly. And we pray, Father, that you will just anoint her, anoint the doctors, and Father, give her full healing after the surgery is complete. Father, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand again if you're able and join me in singing, Be Thou My Vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, say that thou art, thou my best God, by day or by night, bring me 
If you have your Bibles at this time, I'd like you to turn to 1 John chapter 2. That's 1 John chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 15, 16, and 17. 1 John chapter 2. Listen to what the Word of God says here. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever.
hips and my legs seem to be giving away a little bit this morning. Which brings me to the topic of my retirement. As I get closer to retirement, I keep wondering what I'm going to do with all the things that I've accumulated in my office. Because I am quite confident that Pam is never going to let me bring them into our house. <laughs> the truth is, over the years, a lot of stuff has uh, shown up on my walls and, and the shelves of my study. My drawers are filled with knickknacks, including everything from medicine to snacks. And that doesn't even include all the books that I've accumulated over the last 45 years. All of which proves that if you spend as much time at church as I do, you tend to surround yourself with the little comforts of home. But you also tend to be a little bit isolated from the challenges of trying to live a Christian life. In other words, I don't get tossed out there into the real world the way you do on a Monday morning. You have to struggle with questions like, do the beliefs, the values, the teachings of the Bible really work outside of the church sanctuary? You know, the word sanctuary means a place of refuge. Does your faith work outside of this place of refuge? Sometimes you can't even help but wonder if it's even possible to live a Christian life in a cutthroat, dog-eat-dog, bottom-line world. Well, these are some of the questions we're going to try to answer this morning during this sermon. But before we get to that, we do need to recognize a few facts. The, fact, the first fact is, Jesus says, you will be hated because of me. I think Jeff Greenfield is one of the most perceptive journalist working in America today. In one of his books, he writes these words, On a typical Sunday morning in America, there are more people attending houses of worship than the total attendance at all the NFL games in a season. And yet, to watch national television news, you'd think this country is totally indifferent to matters of faith. I just want to tell you one thing. This is nothing that is new. The world has always been indifferent, if not downright hostile, to the truth of God's Word. After all, the Bible doesn't make any compromises with sin, and the world has never liked that. Go back and read the Old Testament. The Jewish people were subjected to countless episodes of persecution over the years. Everywhere they went, people disliked them. They treated them badly. And why? Because they were stubbornly obedient to God's Word. And that made the people that they encountered sort of uncomfortable, kind of uneasy with them. When Jesus taught His disciples what it would be like to live in the world as a Christian, He said, you will be hated by everyone because of Me. As a general rule, Christians today have no idea what it is to be hated because of their relationship with God, at least Christians here in the United States. Do you remember when Dan Cathy, the CEO of Chick-fil-A, took a stand supporting traditional marriage between a man and a woman? Which is actually what he said, but his words have been twisted by people with an agenda ever since. My problem comes when some prominent Christians claim that, that people like Dan Cathy are being hated or persecuted because of their faith. My point is, who is persecuting Dan Cathy? I mean, every time I go to, ch to try to run by Chick-fil-A to get some ice cream, I find that there's a mile-long line that I will not wait for, even if it is their pleasure to serve me. Dan Cathy's business has not been affected one iota. Dan Cathy isn't going to jail for his opinions. As an American citizen, he still has the right to say whatever he pleases. Look, if Dan Cathy is your idea of a persecuted Christian, then you would have no idea what it means to be hated because of Jesus. Being persecuted for your faith means people, and most importantly, the power of the government is used to beat you, to imprison you, 
and even kill you because you proclaim your faith in Christ. That's what it means to be persecuted for your faith. And in today's world, there are millions of Christians who live with this every day. They are persecuted for their faith. They are martyred for their beliefs in Jesus. But that is not happening to Christians who live in the United States, and we can be thankful for that. But if genuine persecution should ever happen to you, or someone should simply say they don't like the things that you talk about when you talk about Jesus, you are not supposed to whine about it and complain that you're being persecuted. Instead, you're supposed to consider it an honor, a privilege, a joy to suffer for the cause of Christ. The second thing that, in, the second fact that you need to recognize is you need to live out your beliefs. You have a responsibility to live out those beliefs every single day. Now, we know that the world doesn't like to be reminded of the truth of God. Many Christians today believe that they no longer have the rights to, to express their values and convictions out in the world. See, the world says you're not supposed to impose your beliefs on another person. You ever heard that expression? All right. The truth is you can't impose belief on anyone. It is, all it is, your Christian responsibility is simply this, to live out your faith everywhere you go. And why would, I don't know why anybody would have any objections to that. I mean, look at the values taught in the Bible. Love, compassion, grace, and life-changing love. Honesty, forgiveness, and personal integrity. Goodness, decency, morality, righteousness, ethical behavior, and a belief in the value of human life. Justice for all concern for the poor and the responsibility that we have to care for those who are less fortunate than we are. Have any of you been following Tim Tebow's efforts to become a tight end with the Jacksonville Jaguars? Now, Tim Tebow has never played that position, and he has, ne he has been out of the NFL for the last eight years, which means that he's attracting a lot of attention. Most sports pundits don't believe that Tim Tebow can, can, should be playing football at this time of his life. He was a, you know, let's be honest, he was a mediocre quarterback, and he has no skills of a tight end. But let's put aside looking at this from a sports perspective. Let's do what ESPN Stephen A. Smith has done when he thought about Tim Tebow. He said, Tim Tebow is a wonderful man who lives out his faith in Christ boldly and courageously. I just don't think he happens to have what it takes to make it in the NFL. All I know is that this dude is the genuine, real deal as a human being. We know that every encouraging word that comes out of his mouth is believable, that he's draped in spirituality and leans on it more than his game. The thing is, if anybody is capable of making someone hope they are wrong, it's Tebow, who leaves you feeling that way. Decency breeds such emotion. In that department, Tim Tebow stands alone. Wouldn't you like someone to write those words about you? Listen to what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Do not neglect, neglect your gift which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And this brings me to the third fact about trying to live a Christian life. You must be prepared for the challenge. You've got to prepare yourself for the challenge. You know, the Bible describes the Christian life as a form of spiritual warfare. You may think that you're simply dealing with a secular world who doesn't care much for the things of God, but the Bible says you are battling the rulers, the authorities, the powers in this, of this dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's what you're up against. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17. Listen to what the Bible says here. 
Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, it might sound like Paul is simply describing the the armor that's worn by a Roman soldier, but he's doing something more than that. What Paul is doing is he's trying, he's trying to tell you, just like a soldier would never think about going into battle without all of his armor, As a Christian, you should not think of going out into spiritual battle with all of your spiritual armor. And then Paul goes on to tell you what that armor is. He talks about the belt of truth. This refers to the truth of God's perfect, infallible word, the Bible. He talks about the breastplate of righteousness. This is the righteousness that comes from a faith relationship with Jesus. For we are saved by faith, by grace, through faith, not of works, so that no one can boast. Paul talks about the shield of, of, of uh, the helmet of salvation, the, excuse me, the shield of faith, that con- the faith that rests on the simple trust and belief that what God says is true. He talks about the helmet of salvation. This is the confidence and assurance that comes from knowing Jesus as your personal Savior. And then Paul talks about the sword of the Spirit. This is the power that comes to you through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And if you are a born-again believer, if you know Jesus is your Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Now let me make a couple of points about putting on this spiritual armor. It's an ongoing process. You don't do it once and then say, well, I've got my spiritual armor on, I don't need to worry about it anymore. This is something that requires the daily disciplines of prayer and Bible study, worship and fellowship. Jesus put it this way. He said, take up your cross daily and follow me. All right. Up to this point, we've been talking about some of the facts that are associated with living a Christian life that you need to be aware of. Now I'm going to start telling you about how you can prepare yourself for the challenges of living a Christ-like life. I want to share some ideas with you that will help you in your daily struggle. The first of these is this. Begin each day with a prayer of commitment. When I was a young man, I I was your first year pastor, I used to get to bed around 11, wake up at 4.30 in the morning, and be in the office by 7 o'clock. Now some of you will understand exactly what I'm about to say. I can't do that anymore. I go to bed earlier, I sleep later, and I try to be in the office between 8.15 and 8.30. But there's one part of my routine that's never changed. I try to begin each day with God in prayer. And my prayer goes something like this. Father, today I want to be your faithful servant. I want everything that I do to bring glory and honor to your name. That is a prayer of commitment. Look, making a choice to live your life for Christ is the key to having a victorious life, a victorious win in the spiritual battle. But this is one of those things where you have to be all in. Without your daily renewal of your commitment to God, you'll inevitably stumble and fall. Now, Listen, Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Listen to what he says. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus says, as Christians, you and I are supposed to be a light to the world, the light of the world. Your purpose should always be to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, to proclaim him as King of kings and Lord of lords over all. 
You know, I've, I've said this a lot of times, but it still needs to be repeated. Always remember this. Your life may be the only witness someone has to the truth of God. Abraham Lincoln once attended a worship service that was being preached by a very prominent past pastor. After the service was over, someone asked the president what he thought of the sermon. He said, well, I didn't particularly care for it. His questioner kind of had an odd, puzzled look on his face. He said, why not? Didn't, did the, didn't the preacher do a good job? Lincoln replied, actually, he did. He handled his text remarkably. His delivery was impeccable. So then why didn't you like the sermon? Because he never challenged me to do something great for God. He never challenged me to do something great for God. Folks, today I'm offering you the ultimate challenge. On behalf of God, I'm asking you to live for Christ in a non-Christian world. I'm asking you to be a light to the nations. I'm asking you to share with others the way of salvation in the name of Jesus. It's not easy. That's why you have to begin each day with that prayer of commitment. And that means to me the second thing you can do to, to grow your spiritual life. Don't put yourself in situations that might ask you to compromise your faith or sin against God. Right now, I want you to listen to, to as I read the Lord's Prayer. It's, it's, actually, this is from the Message Bible, so it's going to sound a little different. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best. As above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiven uh, with others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in glory. Yes, yes, yes. Now I will grant you that this particular translation does not have the same beautiful language that the King James Version has. But I like the way it says. Keep us safe from the devil and from ourselves. See, a lot of times you fall into temptation because you put yourself in situations where the temptation to sin is so great. Think about it this way. If you, were, if you dealt with the disease of alcoholism, where would you have a greater chance of having a victory in your struggle? By hanging out at a bar or by going to church and hanging out with Christian friends? Don't even have to answer that question, do we? We know what the answer is. Don't put yourself in those situations where Satan can tempt you. Now, God will, get, will and He can, and He will give you strength to defeat any temptation that comes into your life. But, I mean, why give Satan a chance to take pot shots at you? You ever thought about that? Why do that? Learn to avoid those circumstances and situations that prevent unbearable temptation. It's the only wise and Christ-like thing to do. That brings us to the next thing, thing, you, thing you can do in, as you're trying to live a Christian life. And that is, ask yourself a question. What would Jesus do? Remember those bracelets, WWJD? You know, I've often thought it would be great if God just would just, you know, create a website. Surely somebody up in heaven can, can create a website, right? Right? And wouldn't it be great, every time you had a question about what you should do in a particular situation, you could just type in something like, uh, what do I do when I know I've been undercharged on a, on, a, on, a, on a restaurant bill? You ever been in that situation? Some people always, people always complain when they get charged too much. But Chris, they don't complain when they get charged too little, do they? Okay, so you could type that question into your, into your computer or smartphone, and the answer would come back. You should be honest and point out the mistake to the wait waitress or waiter. But the problem is, GodAnswers.com doesn't exist. And, and, and so you have to try to use the resources that you've got to decide what Jesus would do. Now, the, lead, the resources that you have include the, the, the guidance of the perfect Word of God, the leadership of the Holy, question, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, but over the years, I've, I've developed four questions that I always ask myself 
when I'm trying to figure out what would Jesus do? The first question is, will this, will what I'm about to do bring glory to Jesus or harm the cause of Christ? As a Christian, your goal should be to bring glory to God in everything that you say and do. Your goal should be to never do anything that would harm the proclamation of the name of Jesus. Now, if what you're thinking about doing you know, does not accomplish those goals, then you shouldn't do it. The second question you can ask yourself goes like this. Would Jesus do what I'm thinking about doing? Now, Jesus was never the boring killjoy that some Christians try to make him out to be. But make no mistake about it. Everything that Jesus did honored and glorified his heavenly daddy God. So if you couldn't imagine Jesus doing what you're thinking about doing, it's probably not a good idea to do it yourself. Third, ask yourself this question. Did Jesus face anything similar in the Bible? Now, in this sped-up, technology-driven world, you're not going to be able to answer the, the, the question, every question that you have. We've already talked about that. I mean, Jesus didn't know anything about hybrid cars or cloud computing, right? So some things are going to come along where the Bible just doesn't have a, have a clear answer for you. But if the worst thing that happens is you spend more time studying the Bible, you will be blessed and God will give you leadership. Finally, you can ask yourself, ask yourself this question. Will what I'm doing put a smile on God's face? In the purpose-driven life, Rick Warren points out that you and I were created to bring God pleasure. By asking yourself this question, would, would, would this put a smile on God's face? 99 times out of 100, you'll wind up doing the right thing. And that brings me to another question way that you can, a thing you can think about to help you grow in Christ, to live a glorious Christian life. Exercise caution when it comes to the gray areas of life. You know, some things that you and I face in life are very simple. If the Bible says do something, you do it. If the Bible says don't do something, you don't do it. You obey God's word or you're choosing to sin against God. It's that simple. But what about those gray areas? Situations or circumstances where you can't point to a specific answer in the Bible, that's when the going gets tough. Let me give you four examples of gray areas in, in our lives. Entertainment can be a gray area, the entertainment choices that you make. Now, some people believe that you should never watch a movie that was produced in Hollywood and never listen to any music unless it's Christian music. Other Christ, 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 Christians enjoy a wide variety of entertainment. I, I do. Man, there, there, there are literally thousands of songs of every genre on my phone, mostly jazz. So I like it. But, you know, if it's a gray area in your life and, and you feel like it's keeping you from living for Jesus, don't do it. Gambling is a gray area in life. Some Christians are opposed to any and all forms of gambling. Others see no problem with, you know, buying a lottery ticket or, or playing bingo or, or, you know, gathering together for a group, with a group of friends to play a game of poker. Work can often create gray areas in your life. These days, many employers expect employees to work on Sunday. You know, think about it. My, my employer's been doing that for the last 40 years of my life. But you know, in today's economy, it may not be possible to tell your employer, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be working Sunday because I'll be in church, because that can get you fired. The consumption of alcohol as a beverage is a gray area for some people. Look, there's no doubt the Bible warns against drunkenness and the abuse of alcohol can lead to health, serious health problems. On the other hand, there's no question that Jesus drank wine. Talks about it. The Bible describes him drinking wine. You know, <laughs> this is how, this is how legalistic and ridiculous some people in the Southern Baptist Convention have become lately. There are people, including missionaries, 
who are being fired because they drink wine. Which leads me to the conclusion that Jesus wouldn't be allowed to be a missionary in the Southern Baptist Convention. Which is kind of ridiculous, isn't it? You know, the Corinthian Christians faced a serious gray area when it came to the question of eating meat that had been sacrificed in pagan temples. Most of this meat was, mostly that was the only meat that was available in the Corinthian marketplaces. So some of these Corinthian Christians wrote Paul saying, well, what, what should we do about that? Well, Paul answers that question in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Listen, 1 through 9. Listen to what the Bible, or take your Bibles and let's read and see what Jesus, what the Bible says here. Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and from whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. When Paul was talking about those go other gods and lords, he was making sort of a, sarca it's sort of a sarcastic comment in the Greek. He, do, he doesn't believe, there's there, there no such thing as other gods. But everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, Paul is making two important points here. First of all, as a Christian, you have freedom in Christ, which means you don't have to worry about man-made rules and regulations. On the other hand, you should be careful not to hurt other Christians in the process of exercising your own freedom. Jesus made this responsibility clear in Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. And that brings us to the final th thing I, I want to tell you. Something that will help you with the challenge of living a Christian life. And that is, Remember that God is still in the business of forgiving sin. Here's the problem with trying to engage in spiritual warfare in a world that does not believe in God. Sometimes you're going to fail. In spite of your best efforts, you're going to fall into sin. Times like this, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, provides powerful words of encouragement. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Remember, John's writing these words to Christians. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I want you to notice this if-then proposition that's in these two verses of Scripture. If you confess your sin to God, then God will graciously and freely forgive you of all your sins and cleanse and purify you. You know, the amazing story of God's grace is that you don't have to manipulate or convince God into forgiving you of your sin. In love, God decided long ago to forgive people in the name of Jesus. Romans 5, 6... 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look, here's the bottom line. 
if you go through your life and you keep falling into sin, you can rest assured that through the blood of Jesus Christ, God is going to forgive you. And when God forgives you, He removes the stain of your sin as far as the east is from the west and chooses to remember it no more. Then God picks you up and dusts you off and says, now, go back out there and keep trying to live for me. Of those thousands of songs that I mentioned a moment ago that are on my iPhone, one of my favorites is by a New Orleans band called the Neville Brothers. The song is called Sands of Time. And a line from the lyrics goes like, goes like this. Now the scriptures say to do our best, and the grace of God will do the rest. Which is really the answer to trying to live a Christian life to every challenge that might come your way, to know that the grace of God will do the rest. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, moment, this time of worship that we've had this morning. Father, we lift you up and glorify you for allowing us to be here today. And Father, everything that has happened today has been, to, has been planned out for a purpose. And that is, people will be given a chance to respond to your call in their life. Maybe there's someone here today or who's watching online who's never asked Jesus to be their Savior. I pray, Father, that they will receive Christ into their life today and become a Christian by praying this prayer. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are God's one and only Son. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I believe that you were physically raised from the dead three days after your death on the cross. Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I invite you to come into my life and be my Savior. And Father, if someone has prayed this prayer with me or just listened and nodded their heads and said, yes, God, this is what I want, this is what I believe, then, Father, today they've become a Christian. And I hope that if they're here in the, in the sanctuary, that they'll come forward when the invitation is given and say, Steve, I've asked Jesus to be my Savior, and now I'm ready to be baptized in Jesus' name. If there's someone who's watching, I pray that they'll send me an, an email at the address shown on the screen. Father, there may be someone else who who's looking for a new church home, and they feel like that maybe this is the place. And I pray they'll come and say, I'd like to move my membership here. I'd like to join by statement, whatever, however way they come. If they're, again, Father, if they're watching online, just help them send me an email. An email. There may be others who want to recommit themselves to Jesus. Whatever decision needs to be made, Father, we pray that it will be made in your glorious name. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of decision is hymn 367. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Let's stand and sing together.
thank you for being here. Thank you for watching this morning. We appreciate that. We're going to be going out now to have a good time, have a good meal together. So I hope, even if you didn't come prepared for it, stay with us. Hey, we got, we're going to have plenty. And if you, don't, if you don't get enough, you can eat my part, OK? We just want you to come and have a good time. In the meantime, I hope you'll have a great week. Next Sunday, of course, we're going to be celebrating Father's Day. And then two weeks from today, I'm going to start a series of sermons that I'm going to do periodically from now throughout the fall. And that is on how you get ready to say goodbye to an old pastor and say hello to a new pastor. And in two Sundays, what I'm going to talk about is the process that I've gone through to believe that God is telling me now is the time for you to, to retire and hand over the reins to somebody else. So uh, that's what's coming up in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, I got to tell you, my hips and my legs have given out. My neuropathy is really acting up today. So please excuse me for not standing up with you in the back, but I'll see you outside. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing our song together. Mm -hmm.